This week on the Computer Chronicles, the Y2K problem. We'll show you how to check your computer's CMOS and BIOS for possible year 2000 glitches. We'll look at some software that examines your applications and files to make sure they're Y2K compliant. We'll talk to Microsoft about some reported Y2K problems with Windows, and we'll search the web for good and bad information about what you should do to deal with Y2K. Plus, we'll look at the mainframe side of the problem. Can you count on power, water, money, and safe air travel on January 1? Also, my pick of the week, a new way to listen to books on tape without the tape. It's all coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by PeopleSoft, a global supplier of enterprise application software for business, education, and government. PeopleSoft, we work in your world. By TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. And by TVA, Television Associates, bridging the worlds of computers and video with DVD authoring and MPEG encoding services. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Y2K, we've been hearing about this computer problem for a long time now. The question is, how serious is it, and what, if anything, can you do about it? If you don't think this is a serious problem, let me show you Exhibit A. There is a rather large global company called Shell Oil, and you would think they have the computer resources to deal with the Y2K problem. Let me show you the credit card that Shell Oil recently sent me. It says right here, as you can see, valid till the year 1000. Whoops. Well, if Shell Oil can't figure out how to solve this problem, my guess is there are other serious problems lurking out there come January 1, 2000. On this program, we're going to focus primarily on how the Y2K problem can affect your personal computer. And there are several levels of the problem. We'll deal with all of them. Hardware problems in the form of the CMOS chips and the BIOS in your computer's motherboard, your operating system, your software applications, and your files. And we'll start with the hardware issues. And Mike, I guess that's your territory here. Mm -hmm. uh, you've pulled a motherboard out of a PC here. And why don't you explain to us what the hardware side of the problem is? Well, basically, your date originates from your CMOS chip inside your motherboard. OK, so that's a CMOS chip. And that's being run by this battery, and that always is remembering what the date is. Yes, and that is where your 19 is embedded that you've heard so much about that causes the Y2K. Got it. And then what about the BIOS? All right, the BIOS at boot up time calls the CMOS for its date and time. Okay, so the okay. BIOS chip is over here. Correct. It says, hey, what's the date? And if this guy gives it the wrong information, everything goes to hell it after that. Correct. Passes it straight to the operating system. Therefore, you'll have an invalid date when you yeah. reboot January 1st. Now, 2000. given it's a hardware problem, can we still fix it and deal with it in software? Yes. What yeah. we do is actually, with PC Fix 2000, uh, we're intercepting that date exchange between the CMOS and BIOS, uh, correcting and adjusting any dates that need to be there, writing them back to the chips and handshaking it off. All right. So operating. I can load some software on my computer that will check and say, hey, CMOS, if you're wrong, I'm going to fix it before you spread that date to the rest of my computer. Correct. How do I know if I have a problem? Can I use your software to test it and see if my CMOS is delivering the wrong date? Yes. We have a package called EasyCheck 2000 that will actually check all, all sorts of dates. All right, can like we do that? I mean, I guess what we're going to do is simulate New yeah. Year's Eve 1999 and 2000? Right. What we'll do is simulate a boot process in your PC. And what we'll do is take a look at the CMOS clock and the BIOS clock and what it's reading as we speak. Now, we'll, we'll simulate the boot by setting it to 1231.99, just All a right. few seconds before So it, it's New Year's Eve, December 31st. That ball is coming down in Times right. Square. And what will your computer do? Okay. So here we go. We All set right, a couple the seconds to go. Two, one. Whoops. Uh, and our CMOS clock went to 1900. Now, right. now the BIOS somehow still said 2000. Correct. On most post-96 machines, the BIOS is correcting for the 1900 in the CMOS. But we could still have a problem if an application is directly accessing Correct. the there CMOS are, there chip. There are applications that do that, and there's uh, Windows NT operating system does yeah. that as well. So my computer, or many apps on my computer, are now going to think it's 1900, which is wrong. Yeah. So things will get screwed up. How do I fix it with the software? Actually, at each boot up, we will execute PC fix at boot up time, apply our algorithm, retrieve the date. And now the CMOS is 2000. And correct. All right, so you've got a kind of memory resident piece of software that's constantly going in there correcting that problem. No, it does not remain in memory. It doesn't. It doesn't take up any resources. It doesn't conflict with any software. 
But somehow it just permanently fixes that problem? Does it, it does its job at boot up time, then goes away. Yeah. Let me, let me ask this now. Why should I care that my CMOS clock is wrong? Is that really going to have any consequences to me as I'm doing my work on my PC other than the fact that the computer thinks it's the wrong date? If you're using any uh, calendar software or date and time sensitive software, uh, you could very well boot up January 1st, 2000, and every appointment you've ever had could... Uh, you're 100 years late for that appointment, it's going to tell late. me. Um, and it could cause uh, accounting software packages. Sure. Now, if I have a reasonably new computer, I bought it within the past year or two, could it still have a CMOS problem? It could very well. The CMOS technology is still in today's motherboards or using the old Motorola technology that has the 19 embedded still in it. Still could be chip. old chips and they could still have that problem, this, even though it's a new PC. This PC here is a uh, six month old. Six month wow, old. still has the problem. Last question. You've got something up on your website, a free download that will check the CMOS problem? Right. That's the EasyCheck 2000 product and it will check uh, all your hardware got it. needs. Mike, thank you very much. Well, let's move to another part of the Y2K problem, your software applications and your files. What can you do to make sure they are Y2K compliant? And I guess your answer is by Norton 2000, right? That's right. <laughs> what does Norton 2000 actually do? How do I deal with the applications and the files? Uh, we run a scan on, on your system and we look at all the commercial off-the-shelf applications and then we actually look at the data that's within your, your files, like your spreadsheets. All right, so we take a look at the screen here. Again, I can run a big scan and right. run my applications, run my files. Right. And let's go, go to the applications first. What kind of report do I get? Right, this is the first report you see and it uh, breaks uh, down into three categories. Really bad problems, maybe a problem, seems to be okay, huh? Exactly. Um, and then you can drill down on each right, of them. So if I say, uh, it says real serious problems and... Um, well, severity fives and severity threes mm. in here. Five means it's really not going to be bad. able to handle dates beyond okay, 99. So that's the worst, the severity that's five. The severity three might be screwed up a little bit. Severity three sometimes have workarounds. Yeah. Well, this is like big deal. CC Mail, Excel, plus PowerPoint, Windows, <laughs> exactly. right? So I have some problems here. What do I do next now that I know I have those problems? Well, if you drill down further, uh, we explain the issue, um, provide a direct link to the vendor's website because sometimes they'll have a patch uh -huh. or an upgrade something like that. Um, and then also sometimes there's a workaround, and if so, we'll provide that suggestion. All right, so you're not going to fix this for me, but you're going to tell me where to go to get it fixed. Go to the Microsoft website, download this patch, and that will solve the problem. Exactly. Uh, okay. All right, now what do I do about particular files? All right, I know Excel's no good, but does that, does that mean all my spreadsheets are screwed up? No, not necessarily. Um, again, it depends on the compliancy of, of the application And itself. how I entered the and, data And how you entered the yeah. date. All right, um, so what is this? So here is, is the scan that we've run on the data. Um, again, you see the severities. All right, so you're looking at the actual files now, not the applications anymore. Exactly. And you're telling me, hey, I've got two Severity 5 spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, that are just going to not exactly. function anymore. Yeah, and if this is something that you're doing financial planning for your yeah. future, you know, you want those So what do I do? I mean, am I just stuck? No. Um, Norton 2000 will give you um, exact information on what the problem is. It will tell you exactly what cell Oh, is. so it's saying there's specific cells that have date information exactly. that are causing the problem. Exactly. And All right, now what do I do? Well, you go in there, um, and also for Excel spreadsheets, um, we provide a real nice visual way of seeing where the problems are. So I'll show you an example of that. Here we go. Okay, so you color right. code the, the Co bad cells. Exactly, and annotate. So the, the yellows are a three, and the pinks are a four, and the reds are a five. So the reds are the severity five ones, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Now, I've got a lot of bad cells. Obviously, they're all the date things. You're right. Now, why, well, would so, why would some dates be red and some would be yellow? They're all dates. Well, because this one, um, it's, it, as you see, it's listed as a two-digit year, but in this case, it's actually been read correctly. It's, it's being okay. read as 1988. But it might be included in the formula be, somewhere exactly. else. Exactly. Okay. Um, so this one is wrong, and then this one in the red is relating back to, to that cell right there that's, that's yeah. wrong. Now, what do I do now? I mean, am I just stuck to just say, don't use the spreadsheet, or can I go in and no. correct that you problem? You can go in, change it into a four-digit date, you know, fix the formula if there is a formula Okay, so code. the problem might have been mine. I was careless like exactly. everybody else, and I used a two-digit year, just make it a four-digit year, and that could solve the problem. We've all been programmed to enter four-digit years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the, in the work you do with Norton 2000, are there obvious certain applications that are the suspect ones that, that I should look out for? Um, in general, anything that relies on, on dates, so calendar programs, any financial applications. Uh, anything, anything that draws a conclusion based on the date, exactly. not, not, a, not a, word pr uh, a word processing document, obviously. Exactly. All right, Norton 2000. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, while we're focusing on the PC side of the Y2K problem, the big fear that most people have is not about their personal computers, but about the massive mainframe systems that run the power companies, the banks, the airlines, most of our basic services. Here's a look at what some experts have to say about what will happen with those come January 1. 
On a bright spring day in San Francisco, the millennium bug is probably not foremost in people's thoughts. But hidden inside most basic services, from water and power to streetlights and buses, are embedded chips and software that might depend on the date and time to operate. That is what worries cities like San Francisco, which began its Y2K probe four years ago. With the embedded systems, we're looking at fire trucks. You know, it's a, it's a whole different look at the world and, and the valves and the water system. If there's an embedded system in a valve and it fails, what will probably happen? If the valve is open, it will probably stay open. If it's closed, it will probably stay closed. Is that a bad failure? Is that something we can fix over time? Also, virtually all valves have manual overrides, but has anybody used them in the last 20 years? Susceptible chips can show up in unlikely places. For example, the city's cable car system, over 100 years old, runs from electric generators that are controlled by computer. Light rail vehicles are almost completely automated, and even buses and fire trucks have embedded microprocessors. We are finding that with heavy equipment, there are other issues with maintenance cycles. And there are pre-built maintenance cycles for things, for example, like water pumps and the ladders that go up and the engine. And some of those systems on some fire trucks, if they're not serviced, don't work. The Wells Fargo Bank approached Y2K in a different way, by building a parallel banking system and then advancing the dates. So a fictitious customer can make a deposit or transfer funds on December 30th, 1999, and a fictitious teller could see those funds appear on January 3rd. We've created a miniature bank of our own. Um, actually, if it was, uh, you could pick up this environment and probably sell it to some other banking institution because it handles a couple hundred thousand um, customer accounts. These aren't real accounts, these are test accounts that we have out there. And we process a full day's activities from uh, printing out statements to uh, sorting checks. Wells Fargo's bank within a bank has everything from PC banking to receipt printers to ATMs. But what happens at midnight December 31st? So far, so good. The tests themselves, we're in contact with them. They're working pretty good. We have um, until June of this year to complete everything. So number are getting into place now and being set up. And as an industry as a whole, I think we are in very good shape. Um, people have taken this very seriously, especially in the financial services in industry. And the work is taken care of. Um, I'm very comfortable. Assuming you can withdraw cash from your ATM in January, will you be able to spend it, say, for an airplane ticket? Airports face the known problem of finding and fixing embedded controllers with an additional complication. They will be counting on every other airport to do the same. It's a real problem because we're not the only airport in the country. Um, a lot of airport uh, manufactured products are uh, duplicated at other facilities, not necessarily airports, but uh, other manufacturing facilities or uh, public transportation hubs and that sort of thing. It's almost unbelievable the amount of inventory that we are going through uh, from, from some of the major components that make up the facility to some of the very minor things that, uh, that you would never think of uh, unless you went through an exercise like, uh, uh, like an inventory. The task is daunting, to find every chip and program that might have a date function and rewrite or replace it. But some areas get immediate attention. We have to look at everything imaginable, uh, I think, but you have to, have, uh, you have to set, a, set priorities. And the priority is the, the safety security aspect. So uh, we have to maintain a secure airport. We have to provide safety for the traveling public. Embedded controllers are lurking everywhere, even in services that appear to be low-tech. San Francisco's water supply comes by aqueduct from the Sierra Nevada mountains, using gravity as its main engine. But pumps, chemical systems, and valves are operated by Programmable Logic Controllers, or PLCs. All of the chips have been inventoried, but what if one malfunctions? Actually, there's very little high-tech. The, when this system was designed, it was, it was a brilliant engineering feat um, in the early part of the century. 
and most of that infrastructure is still in place where we have upgraded a number of, like you mentioned, valves, the, the devices that move the valves, um, the monitoring equipment. Um, valves are either open or closed and these types of valves don't close automatically if there's an electronic failure or a power failure. So most of we're very comfortable that the water will continue to flow by gravity even if there are Y2K issues. And uh, I think, I really do, I think that people are going to be surprised that uh, uh, when uh, December 31st at midnight uh, comes around, uh, the, the world is not going to come to an end. Uh, airplanes are going to continue to fly. The lights aren't going to go out in the terminals. Uh, the lights aren't going to go out on the freeways. And uh, I don't think it's going to be some of the massive failures that uh, has been portrayed uh, in the media recently. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Sarah O'Brien. Well, the one issue we haven't dealt with yet in the Y2K problem is what about your computer's operating system? And of course, in most cases, that means is Windows Y2K compliant, so let's find out. Don, when we did that little scan before with the lady showing us Norton 2000, up popped up Windows 98 as a severity 3 problem. People have heard about this. What are the issues in Win 98? Um, well, actually, there's a patch for Windows 98 that makes it fully compliant, so all those issues are resolved. Okay. But, I mean, what are the issues? Yeah, there are some minor issues that we did find. Let me give you a couple of examples. Okay. Um, one of them is in what we call a dialer. If you go into the phone dialer... Yeah, no, you wouldn't think that would be a date-sensitive Relatively thing, right? obscure, but okay. a lot of things generate logs that are date-stamped, okay. and that's where that comes okay. from. So you could use the phone dialer, say, to call your relatives, right. and then look in that log. And what would happen is, in the year 2000, beyond 2000, instead of saying the call took place January 1st of 2001, right. say January 1st of C1. Oh, that's helpful. So <laughs> okay. it's, it's a display <laughs> issue. Is there a chance for data loss? None whatsoever. All right. So that's, just, that's a little baby problem, and yeah. you can fix that. Yeah. What, what's another Win 98 problem? Uh, well, in Internet Explorer, there's this feature called the wallet. Mm -hmm. And if you actually go into content... So you can store credit card information, that exactly. kind of thing? Exactly. What it's used for is to upload your information to um, an Internet uh, okay. site that's I, maybe... I see the problem it. coming. Expiration dates. You got it. All right. So say so you add a new credit card, and you go to Credit Card Wizard, and you enter in the card and the expiration date. Right. You put the expiration date in a zero, zero. So if it expires in 2000... It wouldn't work. It would come like back it. with an error. If it's 2000, it works just fine. Okay, so you can't enter a two-digit answer in there. Exactly. Or now, is that something you simply have to know, or is there a patch to fix it? There that is a patch. Too? The Windows 98 Y2K patch right. fixes all of these issues. So, I mean, these are relatively little things. You're saying, in general, Win95, Win98, not a big problem. Yeah, the issues are all minor, very obscure. Most users wouldn't run into them. Yeah. Let's get to the application side. Again, when we did that scan, we saw all your stuff coming up, you know, Excel and Access and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what are you doing about, I mean, Norton showed us we have the problem, and then we have to go to Microsoft to fix the problem. What are you guys doing to help us solve some of the application problems? Okay, well, the first thing we're doing, of course, we've got the website, which has 1,800 products now that we've tested and verified, okay. as well as a toll-free number. But beyond that, what we've done is we've come up with a product called the Product Analyzer. And what this will do is it'll scan your hard drive, It'll verify what Microsoft files you have against mm -hmm. the database, report back the compliance status, and then any more information. Okay, so this you might is your version of scanning for all the Microsoft exactly. applications to identify what them. All right. So we go through and we find we have some problems. You've now come up with some kind of cool wizards in the Microsoft mm -hmm. style to deal with them. Go through those. Sure. Um, you're talking about our Excel wizard specifically. Yeah. Uh, within Excel, there are three wizards we've created: the Date Watch wizard, Date Fix wizard, and Date Migration. All right. Wizard. So one at a time. What does a Date <coughs> Watch wizard do? It watches how users enter in dates, and then it tells them if they're being ambiguous, or it'll convert those right. dates for Sh them. Show me what you mean. Sure, let's create a new spreadsheet. Okay, and we'll so just type in 10 slash 01 slash 00. So if I use a two digit field, it's well, I was right, it said 2000. It's going to change it to a four digit field for Oh, you. so even if I only do two, it automatically makes a four so Exactly. No and then, it, of course, when it does that, you can look at that and say, oh, that really should be 1900. Okay. Depending on how you're using okay. your spreadsheet. So it'll automatically switch ambiguous dates. Exactly. All right, so what's the other one? Date fix, you said? The date fix wizard. What that does is it'll actually take a spreadsheet and fix those dates within it. All right, so what are we looking at here? Now, this is an unfixed... An unfixed spreadsheet. So what you've got is our birth dates and people's names and just a chart applied to those. All right, so some guy here was born in 1909. You think that's correct? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's, maybe it's 2009 and he's not born yet. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's a problem. All right, so you have a graphic representation of what would be right now uh, a non-compliant issue. Correct. Right, a problem. Correct. And what does date fix do? What it's going to do is going to go through. It's going to convert those two-digit dates to four-digit. 
and then report back what it did so that you can inspect and make okay. sure it did the right thing. Um, so we'll just run that. It's going to auto fix all this. So it's going to print a spreadsheet that says this is what it did. Okay. So in case I want to go back and say that was wrong. And it was 2009. Okay. I mean, and it's obviously a mock up. Exactly. A mock up. It would have made that mistake. Typical Y2K problem. So you can actually go through your spreadsheet either on a case by case basis yeah. like this or against an entire directory and actually apply those. And quickly, to date migration wizard, what does that do? She's taking earlier versions of data from Excel and into Excel 98 and doing exactly that. Oh, so if an old spreadsheet had the problem, you can exactly. correct it as you move it over. Exactly. So you guys are providing the fixes. We are. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. All right, well, as always, the Internet is a great source of information about Y2K, and in some cases, it's a source of misinformation. Well, to help us sort all that out, we've asked Mike Elgin, editor of Windows Magazine, to join us and to show us some of the good and the bad stuff on the web. I guess it's important to think of the Internet as a resource, because we're talking about stuff that's changing every day, isn't it? You might not want to go buy a book about Y2K issues. Right. It, people are discovering a lot and will continue to learn new things all year. So it's a good idea to keep going back to the best websites. Right. Now, you guys, Win Magazine, you have a very good website on Y2K. Why don't you show us that first? Because it's really a kind of portal, if you will, to Y2K problems. Sure, okay. Um, our main uh, Y2K page is what we call Y2K Watch. Okay. And it's primarily a bunch of links, which we think are the best links for people concerned about the PC aspect mm -hmm. of the Y2K problem, both on the hardware and software side. Right, so what kind of links, for example, where, where would you send us? Well, first of all, we've got our Y2K discussion mm -hmm. forum. This is where people who are knowledgeable uh, can get together Trade with people who are looking about for information. problems they found, et cetera. Exactly. It's a discussion area. This is brand new, and this will get more and more uh, rich information okay. in there as we go on. Um, another thing that I emphasize, uh, I want everybody to, to read this article. It's by Fred Langa. It's the single best article about finding and fixing mm. uh, Y2K problems okay. with a personal computer, with a, you and your own computer. And this is different from uh, a IT administrator who needs to worry about the whole company. Right. So lots of resources at your website. And yes. how do I get there? What's, what's the URL? It's winmag.com. Okay. And then just click on the Y2K link. All right. Now, the government has some websites up there, too, right, to theoretically help us out? That's right. Uh, they're providing mm -hmm. a lot of information. And actually, some of them have been based on uh, President Clinton's initiative mm -hmm. uh, to solve the Y2K problem. And, uh, and so this is the presidential uh, Y2K conversion site. And there's a lot of information. These links go into all kinds of private and sort of business-oriented kind of stuff. That's basically. right, especially for business owners. Uh, people people about doing business with the government. That's so right, legal issues, okay. uh, some of the heavier stuff. How about um, from the consumer point of view? Uh, the government has a consumer-based Y2K site that's uh, full of lots of information and will answer just about any question that, uh, that people have. Uh, from different okay. uh, departments. Should I be worried about Social Security? Should I be worried about this and that? Exactly. Insurance and, and on and on. All right. Now, there's another site I know you really like, another independent site. It was, it was Y2000, is it? Yes. It's Peter de Jaeger's uh, site. Now, Peter was the original Y2K uh, guy who was out there right, telling everybody. Right. And uh, this site's been up for years. And it's, huh. he's built this huge database of information, and he's attracted all the experts. So this is an excellent site. Year2000.com. That's a good, good URL. Now, yeah. what about all these people who are saying the world's going to come to an end, you, the planes won't fly, the power mm -hmm. won't work, the ATMs won't work. There are sites up there that are just spreading all kinds of horror stories. I mean, right. wh where do you go if that's sort of your perspective on this? Well, there's a good site that uh, I want to show you here. Now, this is a relatively mild site called the Cassandra Project. Okay. Now, this is for practical uh, information on how to survive any sort of power outages and okay. so on. What and happens if the ATM doesn't work, right? Exactly. The water and stops flowing. Make sure you have water, make sure you have heat and so on. Uh, and it, it, there's also some constructive information about community projects to make sure the neighborhood uh, oh. is working so together this is CassandraProject.org. That's right. Now, there are, some, of course, some other sites that are doing some pretty there. wild things out Right. There, they, yeah. you know, get a, get a gun and some water, <laughs> move to Montana, you know, and hide in a hole somewhere. Um, I think those. I think that view, by the way, is unnecessary. I don't yeah. think that's. But but this happen. is sort of general preparation, just in case bad things happen. Exactly. Now you said, Mike. I want to ask you. I, I always put you on the spot because yeah. you you spend all your time with this stuff. What is your view? I mean, I've heard. I mean, I know people who say I'm going to the hills with a gun. Sure. Other people say I'm getting on a plane January one doesn't bother me. W what do you think? Well, I think there are likely going to be some problems. Um, there are going to be smaller problems. Hospitals are going to have to deal with some specific issues. Uh, uh, planes are not going to fly, uh, drop out of the sky. This is not going to happen. There may be delays. Uh, there, there may be some unpredictable things. But overall, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. Uh, well, we hear about fine. the embedded chip problem. The, hey, yeah, you can fix all this old COBOL language, but what about all these the hardware stuff that's embedded in all these things? Well, that's really the biggest problem because you just can't run a Microsoft patch to, right. to fix these right. things. It's all embedded in hardware, and there's some unpredictability. Some, yeah. of, these, some of these chips are, are decades old, so nobody really knows what's going to happen. 
but uh, overall, all these problems are fixable. Everything is solvable. Uh, are and, you uh, going to buy some extra food and get some extra cash? Under? I'm going to make sure. I live in New York. I'm going to make sure I have heat. <laughs> um, but, but I don't think there will be anything beyond a, maybe a couple of days of power outages yeah. and phone down, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Mike, thanks a lot. All right, that's our look at Y2K. I'll be back in just a moment with my pick of the week. Before I get to my pick of the week, I did want to mention one other Y2K program, which is very good, but which we didn't have time to cover during the show. This is it. It's called IntelliFix 2000. It's a terrific all-in-one solution that solves hardware and software problems. If you're running a business on your PC and Y2K is really important to you, you might want to check out IntelliFix 2000. Cost is only $79. Now for my pick of the week. One of the hot new uses of the Internet is for listening to audio. Sites like Broadcast.com, where you can listen to radio stations, and sites like MP3, where you can listen to and download CD quality music. But one of the fastest growing uses of audio in general is books on tape. And there is a website and an audio player designed specifically for spoken word audio. This is the player right here. It's called the Audible. It's a solid state audio player. You can listen to this using headphones that come with it. You can use the included stereo cassette adapter if you want to listen in your car radio. To download an audio book, you log on to the audible.com website. You can select from thousands of available books, and the cost for the books is about half the price you would pay for the cassette version of the same book on tape. I've downloaded the John Grisham novel Testament, so let me plug this in, and you can hear what it sounds like. I had three families, three ex-wives. Now, you can automate the download process by scheduling feeds in the middle of the night if you'd like, and if the book is longer than the memory capacity of the player, the software automatically updates the player and replaces sections you've listened to with new sections. Now, the player itself lets you skip forward or backward a chapter or to another book for that matter. It also lets you insert bookmarks so you can easily go back to a certain favored place in the book. The Audible comes with a simple docking station like this, which plugs into your serial port. This also acts as the battery charger. The cost for the player is about $200. You can get it for $99 if you agree to buy a minimum number of books online. That's it for this edition of The Chronicles. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back here again next week with the latest in hardware, software, and the Internet. Hope we'll see you here then. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by PeopleSoft, a global supplier of enterprise application software for business, education, and government. PeopleSoft, we work in your world. By TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. And by TVA, Television Associates, bridging the worlds of computers and video with DVD authoring and MPEG encoding services. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic. Next week on the Computer Chronicles, we'll take you to Los Angeles for the annual Excellence in Software Awards the Codys. Actor Robert Urich, comedian Rondell Sheridan, and former Apple CEO Gil Emilio join us as we honor the best new computer programs of the year. The Codies, next week on the Computer Chronicles.